Welcome, 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 everybody, to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we're going to have a little bit lighter of an episode of Fantasy News. Unfortunately, there's been a passing in the family, so we are about to fly up to Kayla's home state uh, to deal with that over the next week, and that is why you'll not be getting a video on Tuesday. I do have the time and mental space, though, to get you a Fantasy News, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump on into it. The first story of the day we're going to be covering, though, is the new Great Hunt cover that has been released for the Wheel of Time that is live action. And I'm never a very big fan of these live action covers, though this is actually not the worst execution I've ever seen. It's certainly not just a screen cap for the show, and there's some effort here to give it depth and some dynamic elements. So I'm actually pretty okay with this for a live action cover and it gets my, I'm not going to put it on my shelf, but I understand why someone would. And in exciting indie cover reveal news, we have gotten the cover for Ice and Ivy by J.D. Evans. And of course, big shout out to the cover artist for this one, Tatiana Anor. I have not seen a cover exactly in this style before, and I think it's really good. And do I have any Dead Cells fans in the crowd? Because we have had it confirmed that we are getting a Dead Cells series animated, of course, coming in 2024. That's all we've gotten so far, aside from the studios attached, but even that little teaser, it had a vibe. Now, this isn't going to be like a gargantuan season of television and instead is going to be 10 episodes of about seven minutes each created by a French animation studio called ADN or the Animation Digital Network and will first be available in France before being released worldwide. We have also had a drop for a new Netflix animated original called Nimona. And this trailer captured my interest because it's taking that fantasy label and stretching it in a interesting direction with really good representation and a animation style, I think Netflix has proven to be a success before. There seems to be a man falsely accused of killing a queen, unless it's like the twist that he turned out to do it, I have no idea, and a shape-shifting villainous sidekick who wants to help him out, and I love shapeshifters, so... I'm in. And I'm very happy to say a show I just started has been renewed for a season two, and that would be Silo. It's actually planned to be your Tuesday video, but Silo, yes, from Apple TV Plus, still the worst name in streaming, is going to be getting a season two. And I think so far, at least from my viewing experience, it's well worth it. This show is very enticing, and I'm kind of glad I actually didn't read the books first on this one. <gasps> I know, scandalous. But the show is so good, and I get to watch Rebecca Ferguson, who's reportedly possibly going to be in a First Law adaptation act, and she has been an absolute joy and shining spot of the show. So I'm liking this show, and even more hype for her potential involvement in First Law. And maybe the biggest piece of video game news this month would be the Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty trailer announcement. It is being reported by people who have played this DLC, part of which will be free, another part that will not, uh, that it's essentially an entire overhaul of the game. Not only are things like the police going to be different, but the way your character upgrades, all kinds of stuff that I can't spend the time to get into here today. But it looks like this has given me an excuse to play Cyberpunk 2077 all the way through for a third time. Like, I'm frustrated the game was released in the state that it's in. I can admire that the team behind it, CD Projekt Red, has put in so much effort to really get it up to par, up to the promise of release, and they have a fantastic track record at CD Projekt Red with DLC, so I'm definitely thinking it'll be worth it, and yeah, I'm sucked right back in. But before we get into the next story of the day, a quick word from today's sponsor, believe it or not, the merch company I work with, Fourth Wall. Many of you know my merch line, as you can see, in recent months has received a significant upgrade, and that is largely due to transitioning over to Fourth Wall. With Fourth Wall, you're able to launch your own brand on your own terms. Their platforms make it easy to design your own homepage with their fully customizable layouts. Choose from a variety of products and their extensive catalog catalogs. Trust me, they are extensive, including name brands like Champion, as well as eco-conscious options. And they provide some of the best customer service and creator support I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Every single tiny hitch there's ever been with us working with Fourth Wall, which there has not been many, they have addressed and resolved 
promptly. That shouldn't be a surprise because they are a creator first oriented merch line. One of my favorite features is the thank you videos option. Hundreds of you have already received some of these videos from me in the past, but it really means a lot to directly connect with you all to genuinely thank you for your support. For any aspiring content creator interested, use my partner link in the description down below and you can get $15 for sample credits on your future merch. So if you're interested in joining thousands of other creators who are using fourth wall to promote their brands, just check out the link in the description down below. Next news. Now, if you'll indulge me for a moment here, I am very happy to give some local Virginia news because on June 24th here in Richmond, we are going to have RippleCon. Yes, on Saturday, June 24th, the Richmond Public Library will be putting on a convention for all things fandom, including Magic the Gathering, fantasy books, and just local authors getting together. I actually was originally going to have a booth here, but due to the family issue that has arisen, I'm not going to be able to attend, but I'm hoping many of you can in my place and make this a smash success for the Richmond Public Library. It'd mean a lot if some goblins showed up. And they might have the best convention mascot. Look at Ripple the Otter. They chose an otter. It's, it's an instant win. Sounds like a good way to spend 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. on that Saturday. Now in the final story of the day, and maybe the biggest and most important, there was a recent quote that has gone a bit viral from the Embracer group, where they are saying they're planning to exploit their ownership of the Lord of the Rings IP as much as possible when it comes to making video games. The full quote, which is important, being, we own Lord of the Rings, and we know we need to be exploiting Lord of the Rings in very significant fashion and turn that into one of the biggest gaming franchises in the world, he said in a webcast, elaborating on the news via IGN. That's obviously something we're going to be doing. That's a much better use of resources than some of the other projects that some of our team have been working on. Now, there's two angles to this story that I feel like can be misunderstood. The first is the usage of the word exploiting I have seen a lot of people fixate on. I actually personally don't mean to be offensive in any way, shape, or form to Swedish people think this might be a case of ESL uh, causing someone to put their foot in their mouth. At least in my experience, the term exploiting comes with a lot of negative connotation, and I don't think that's how this was actually meant by this CEO. The man is from Sweden. He's living in Sweden. I know they're very fluent in Swedish over there. I just don't know if the word specifically exploiting has the exact same connotation culturally. But also in business spaces, those are the types of terms you use. And I don't think this is someone like wringing their hands together saying they're going to like crank out as many crap products as possible as some people seem to have been taking this statement. And instead, it's a CEO who, if you read the second angle of this article in broader context, is trying to focus the resources of their company by cutting down other projects they don't think will be as financially successful to focus more of their resources available to this massive embracer group towards the Lord of the Rings. Personally, I, of course, don't want to see Lord of the Rings milked to just a gargantuan extent, but I'm not necessarily against more Lord of the Rings video games. I don't want more Gollum games, but something more in the line of Shadow of Mordor minus all those annoying purchases you had to make. Sure, I'm absolutely okay with that. And notably, this is not the same company responsible for the Gollum game. I see some people taking this as severely negative, and maybe they're going to turn out to be absolutely right. An Embracer group could fumble the ball. But for me personally, I'm more in the wait and see camp. Thank you so much, everyone. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.